Have you ever heard of the names Tianzhou, Shenzhou, Tianhe, Wentian, and Mengtian? They actually all have one thing in common. They're all connected to the Chinese space station. And in this episode, we're going to tell you everything you need to know about the Chinese space station. Now, in order to keep this episode reasonably short, we are going to limit this to the essential points of the Chinese space station, but we'll have separate episodes targeted at the specific features of the Chinese space station. Also put up some timestamps up here if you want to go to specific parts of this video. And without any further ado, let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Al. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. Now let's start first with a little bit of history and discuss how China got to the point where it is now. Because while China's current space station is extremely recent, China's pursuit of crude spaceflight and just putting humans into orbit actually goes way back. China's dream of putting humans into orbit actually goes all the way back to the 1960s in the vicinity of Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin's successful first flight into space on board his Vostok 1 capsule. Highly impressed, eager to put forward a similar achievement, China began an ambitious crewed space program in the 1960s, kicking off experiments like sending various animals like mice and dogs on board rudimentary sounding rockets and monitoring their health parameters. In 1968, the Institute of Space Medicine was set up in Beijing with instruments to train human astronauts such as vacuum chambers, centrifuges, and rotating chairs. And in 1971, the first batch of Taikonauts was selected among Air Force pilots. And the culmination of this initiative was actually the development of a crewed capsule kicked off in April 1971. This was called Project 714, and this capsule was called the Shu Guang One, which was reported to resemble the Gemini capsule, but only smaller and lighter, and which would be launched on board Long March 2, which was at the time still in development. Now, unfortunately for China, the political turmoil of the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s and also in the 1970s put an end to the project by 1972, and that was exacerbated by Mao's declining interest for crewed spaceflight, despite initially signing off all the early crewed spaceflight initiatives. And Mao famously said in 1972 that terrestrial needs must come first, effectively putting an end to the funding that was required by the Shu Guang One program. Now let's move 20 years forward. We're talking about 1992, where the premises of China's current space station and crew program were actually kicked off with a program called Project 921. And of course, if we really wanted to be historically accurate, we'd have to talk a little bit about the 1980s and something called the Project 863, which was really a push from the Chinese government for uh, the development of high-tech industries. And this had a crude space flight component to it. But for the sake of keeping this video rather short, we're going to leave that out of the discussion. So let's move back to the 1990s. Let's remind ourselves a little bit of the context back there. China's space industry had begun to grow at a significant speed for the country in the 1990s with major milestones that had been reached by then. China had reached a certain mastery of atmospheric reentry technology, for example, with the FSW recoverable satellite program. China also now had heavier rockets, which could be adapted to support the launch of crewed spaceflight. We had um, rockets like the Long March 2E, which, as we will see, will serve as a basis to design the Long March 2F human rated rocket. And by then, China also had a fleet of Yuanwang tracking ships, which enabled tracking of objects in low Earth orbit beyond Chinese terrestrial borders. And while not directly related, also we had a new series of Chinese satellites that also demonstrated China's increased mastery of space engineering. Uh, we had, for example, the geostationary satellite in the 1980s, the Dongfang Hong 2. In the 1990s, we had the Dongfang Hong 3 platform. And interestingly, the end game of the Project 921 that was launched nearly 30 years ago in the 1990s had always been a permanent crewed space station, which is what we are seeing today. And this very long term 
planning from China 30 years is because China in the 1990s was already very well aware that there would be loads of technologies to develop and to validate before actually reaching a technology readiness level, enabling the construction of an actual space station. And this is why Project 921 uh, from the very beginning was split into three phases. The first objective would be to design a crewed spacecraft able to shuttle humans between Earth and low Earth orbit. This spacecraft would be called Shenzhou. And this itself was a major challenge because beyond the spacecraft that had to be designed, there would also be, need to be the development of an associated human rated rocket with an escape system, the necessarily more critical and sophisticated TTNC and communication systems, the life support systems, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the second step that would come after that would be setting up a temporary space station in orbit to validate a number of technologies, such as life support systems, onboard a space station, and also extended space in space, performing rendezvous in space, and docking. And this would be accomplished with the Tiangong 1 and 2 experimental stations. Also in parallel, China would have to develop a cargo supply spacecraft to perform refueling, provide food and water to the Taikonauts, and this would turn out to be the Tianzhou spacecraft. And finally, the last step of the Project 921, which would take place 30 years later, is the actual construction of the permanent space station, which is what we are witnessing now at this very moment. And this would be really the culmination of all the previous technologies developed during the two previous steps put together. Now, I'm not going to go through every detail of this three steps of the Project 921 because this would definitely make the video too long. I want to focus on the space station, but suffice to say that China diligently went through the development of each of these building blocks with some major milestones being, for example, um, in 1999, the launch of the human rated rocket, the Long March 2F. We then had the first launch of a Taikonaut into space in 2003. We had the development of an indigenous pressurized spacesuit called the Feitian, which would be used during the first Chinese EVA performed in 2008 by the Shenzhou 7 crew. Um, China began also sending a number of geostationary relay satellites to maintain communications continuously with the future space station. And this began in 2008 and was accomplished in 2012. China also sent a first experimental space station, Tiangong-1, in 2011, and then Tiangong-2 in 2016. And they performed space rendezvous and docking during this period. And China also designed and launched a cargo supply spacecraft called the Tianzhou in 2017 and practiced things like refueling, among other things. And finally, to send all this heavy new space hardware, China designed a heavy-duty rocket, the Long March 5B, as well as a medium-lift variant, the Long March 7. And as a relatively latecomer to crewed spaceflight, at least compared to the US and Russia, China generally took the approach of selecting proven designs for their systems, often similar to Russian designs, doing this to minimize risk and also to reduce additional development time. You can see this with the Shenzhou, for example, which bears strong similarities with the Soyuz or the Fatian spacesuits, which were built upon um, Russian Orlan suit designs. And also the current Tianhe core module bears a strong resemblance with the architecture of the core module of the Russian segment of the ISS called Svezda. However, I really want to dismiss the copying factor here that we often hear. This is because while yes, China indeed has taken a more conservative approach on building upon existing designs, China has always or very frequently modified, adapted and improved these designs incrementally. And this is true for all the previous designs, all the previous modules that I've discussed previously in this video. And separately, we are seeing now some rather unprecedented projects and designs from China on other topics in the space industry, such as lunar exploration, space telescopes, space-based solar power stations, and quantum communications. So let's just all be modest here. Space is hard for everyone, and it's often a compromise between risk-taking and the associated benefits and you know, being more conservative and with the associated benefits and, of course, the disadvantages. Now, let's talk about China's actual space station. It has multiple names. The most common name that you hear is just Chinese space station, Zhongguo Kongjianzhan. But you also hear it called Tiangong Space Station, Tiangong Kongjianzhan, which means Heavenly Palace. And this must not be mixed up with uh, the two previous experimental space stations that were also called Tiangong. They were called Tiangong 1 and Tiangong 2, launched uh, respectively in 2011 and 2016. Now, let's have a look at what the Chinese space station actually looks like once completed. 
It's composed of three modules. You have the core module, the Tianhe-1, which is the central module to which all other modules in spacecraft will connect to and represents the command center in the living quarters of the Taikonauts. Then we have the Mengtian and the Wentian modules, which are experimental modules, and as the name suggests, they will significantly extend the pressurized and non-pressurized experimental capabilities of the space station while providing additional means of communication, propulsion, power generation, EVA, and even adding additional living quarters for the Taikonauts. The Chinese space station weighs over 60 tons, a mass that's almost equally shared between Tianhe, Mengtian, and Wentian, around 20 to 22 tons apiece, which actually makes sense because this is uh, basically close to the max payload that China's largest launch vehicle for LEO, the Long March 5B, can put into orbit. And we know that Mengtian and Wentian and Tianhe were really tailor-made for this rocket. Both experimental modules will dock radially to the Tianhe-1's multi-docking nod, forming a T-shaped structure. And the Tianhe-1's length is 16.6 meters long, while Mentian and Wengtian are 14.4 meters long. The living volumes will initially be of 50 cubic meters when only the Tianhe module is present in space, and this will be extended to 110 cubic meters once Mengtian and Wentian dock with Tianhe. Not exactly the most spacious place to stay several months, but definitely a major improvement compared to the 15 cubic meters that Taikonauts had with the Tiangong-1 and Tiangong-2 experimental space stations. Now, speaking of stays, once the space station will be fully operational, it is expected to host three Taikonauts for a period of six months, and the number of Taikonauts simultaneously present in the space station can actually reach up to six Taikonauts, as there will be six sleeping quarters once the one tin module uh, will be available and docked with the Tianhe core module, but there is no real current plan to have continuously six Taikonauts in the Chinese space station. The ability to host six Taikonauts is more a feature, I have a feeling, to enable an overlap of a stay between a replacement crew of three and a departing crew of three. Now, let's talk a little bit about the assembly timeline. The Chinese space station is planned to be assembled over two years and 11 launches. Now, how does all of this take place? Let's go into the details a little bit. The construction of the space station will actually be divided into three phases. Three is definitely a figure that we see a lot with the Chinese space station. So we'll have first the critical technology validation phase, then we'll have the construction phase, and finally we'll have the operational phase. So what's with these names and phases? First, the critical technology validation phase. As we mentioned previously, China has been validating space station technology over the past 20 years. We spoke about the Shenzhou spacecraft, rendezvous, docking, EVA, rocket escape systems, just to give a few examples. And actually, China still has a number of technologies to validate, a small number, admittedly, uh, before you can actually say, this is our permanent Chinese space station. And there are notably three so-called critical technologies that have to be tested during the critical technology validation phase. And these are, first and foremost, the life support systems, which put a big emphasis on recycling local resources. Before, with the Shenzhou and the Tiangongs, there was no real resources recycling system. We had literally no reuse of water or of air, and so prolonged stays in space would mean that the Taikonauts in the experimental space station would have to rely very strongly on cargo supply spacecraft. And the goal of the new life support systems on the Tianhe core module is to rely less on cargo resupply and aim at a resources reuse rate of 80%. The second key technology is the robotic arm, which is a manipulator similar to the Canada Arm 2 on the ISS, and which provides assistance to the Taikonauts as they perform various tasks, helps with the docking of incoming spacecraft, and the robotic arm also serves for maintenance purposes. And finally, we have the power systems as the last critical technology to validate. And this notably includes the new solar arrays, as well as electrical propulsion systems, as well as the attitude control systems. And we'll have separate episodes discussing specifically these different technologies. And only when these technologies are considered to be matching the requirements, will the Tianhe-1 module actually become the official 
operational Chinese space station. And currently, this is why the Tianhe One module is also called by the Chinese the Experimental Core Module. It's called the Shi Yan Xing Tang as of 2021. This is because the Tianhe Core Module that's currently in orbit has not been officially validated as compliant, and therefore, it is not yet the official Chinese space station. We are still in an experimental phase. And fun fact, China actually has a backup Tianhe core module in case the performance of the current one that's in orbit is not satisfactory, and in which case the backup will be modified and sent to space to replace it. And there have been some pictures of the backup that have been shown on the internet, which is why this has led to speculation on China planning a gigantic space station where two Tianhe core modules would be interconnected. And the truth is, this is not really the case. This uh, second Tianhe core module is more a backup for the first one. Now, of course, the first Tianhe core module is indeed satisfactory. We can expect the Chinese not to just throw the second backup uh, away, but to send into space and potentially extend the Chinese space station. But that is not confirmed just yet. Now, let's look at a detailed timeline of how all of this will be assembled. The critical technology validation phase will see five launches in total, and this is in 2021. We'll have the launch of the Tianhe core module, which already took place at the time of the video in April 2021. And we also had the launch of the Tianzhou 2 cargo resupply mission in May 2021, and then the crewed mission Shenzhou 12 in June 2021. And then we're looking at two upcoming launches, which are the Tianzhou 3, followed by the Shenzhou 13 in September and October 2021 respectively. Next, this brings us to the construction phase of the Chinese space station. This will take place in 2022. And basically, at this point, uh, the core module will have been validated by the Chinese, by CNSA. And at this stage, they are looking at assembling the remaining parts of the Chinese space station, namely the Wentian and the Mengtian experimental modules. And so firstly, we'll have a Tianzhou-4 cargo spacecraft in a Shenzhou-14 mission sent to orbit to dock with the Tianhe-1 core module of the space station, which will then be followed by the first experimental module, the Wentian. Wentian will first dock actually before being moved to the starboard side by a LIAP arm, which is a smaller size robotic arm. The next Tianzhou cargo spacecraft, the Tianzhou 5, is then launched, followed by the Mengtian experimental module, which will also first dock actually before being moved to the port side docking unit of the multi docking hub of the Tianhe core module. Then the last crewed mission, the Shenzhou 15, is sent into orbit and docks with the Chinese space station, which will still have the Shenzhou 14 crew on board. And this will be the very first time that the Chinese space station will be hosting six Taikonauts simultaneously. Now, the order of the last few steps I mentioned are not yet confirmed. It's still a bit blurry and we haven't received an official confirmation from CNSA. But basically, that is the general idea. Uh, just the order maybe is unclear. And that would mark the end of the operational phase if all goes well. And this means that China will have an operational space station in orbit and ready to focus on space sciences. One of the last sort of remaining parts of the Chinese space station that I haven't really mentioned yet is the Shuntian Space Telescope. Similar to the Hubble telescope, the Shuntian telescope is in space and consequently benefits from not having any of the detrimental atmospheric effects that affect telescopes on the ground. The Shuntian telescope, initially designed to be a full-fledged part of the Chinese space station, will actually be a separate module that will remain certainly in the vicinity of the space station and perform astronomy missions autonomously, but will also typically dock to the Chinese space station on a periodic basis for maintenance purposes. And this will be a remarkable advantage for maintenance because compared to the Hubble Space Telescope that required a dedicated mission from the space shuttle to undergo repairs, the Shuntian Telescope will be able to be repaired directly by the Taikonauts of the Chinese Space Station, and this will make things much more simple. Now, the Shuntian Telescope is not part of this um, operational phase in 2022 just yet. The Shuntian Telescope is expected to be launched in 2024. And this brings us to the end of this introductory episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And on the Dongfang Hour, I just want to add that we are also planning some follow-up episodes on more specific features of the Chinese space station. So really stay tuned for that. On another point, there are also some areas of the Chinese space station that are not 
quite well known. And this is because the Chinese tend to be a tiny bit more secretive about this type of information. So this could be revealed in the future, in which case possibly will necessitate the update of this current episode. So also stay tuned for that. Apart from that, I'm Jean Deville, the co-host of the Dongfang Hour. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next episode. Thank you.